By now, there was a raging influenza epidemic ravaging both central powers and allied armies, and we'll see more of that. But today I'd like to look at another type of illness, one not often talked about during the war, but one that affected soldiers in the millions, venereal disease. <laughs> I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to the Great War. Last week on the Western Front came the Battle of Amel. It was a small battle, but remarkable for being the first combined use of air power, tanks, infantry, and machine guns in one integrated battle plan. The Bulgarian and Ottoman citizenry were starving, and German High Command decided to ditch their foreign minister for daring to suggest that the war could not be won militarily. They certainly did not agree, and had already finalized their plans for the next phase of their Western Front offensives. They actually considered postponing it, though, because of the spread of flu among the German troops, but it will go ahead as planned. Illness was complicating things, though. I know we haven't spoke about it, really, even though it's been growing and growing for the past couple months. But by now, the Spanish flu had reached epidemic proportions. It was affecting both armies, but chronic malnutrition supposedly made it worse on the German side. Thousands of men were becoming too sick for duty. According to G.J. Meyer in A World Undone, as many as 2,000 per German division. And just over the rest of 1918, 186,000 German soldiers would die of the flu. There was one battlefront where epidemic disease had been rampant the whole time, and which we haven't heard much from in a while, the Macedonian front. Now, I mentioned last month that Adolphe Guillaumont had been called home from that front to be military governor of Paris, and had been replaced as commander by Franchet, desperate Frankie, desperé. There was a nice irony here. The idea of the Army of the Orient to attack through the Balkans out of Salonika had actually been Desperate Frankie's idea in the first place back in 1914, when he had suggested it to French President Raymond Poincaré. However, by the time he'd actually gotten a proposal together, the Allies were occupied with the Dardanelles and then Gallipoli in that region. But still, the multinational army at Salonika began building under Maurice Sarrel in late 1915 and was 300,000 men by the summer of 1916. There was some fighting that summer, as we saw, and then the stalemate resumed. But by 1917, there were 500,000 Allied troops there. However, by then, Salonika was something of a joke to the European command. German generals called it their largest internment camp, and Georges Clemenceau called the troops the Gardeners of Salonika. Thing is, it was anything but pleasant there. Men by the hundreds of thousands had gotten malaria, which was endemic, and the city itself was no picnic. It had been part of the Ottoman Empire until just a few years ago, and thousands upon thousands of refugees from the Balkan Wars were living on top of each other in hellish slums. Well, anyhow, Guillaumont had replaced Sarrel, and he had spent the earlier part of this year making preparations for a a limited attack against the Bulgarians, which seemed promising, especially with the Germans pulling out troops from the region to use in their Western Front offensives. But now, desperate Frankie was finally in charge of what had been his idea nearly four years ago. And now, in addition to the Allied forces already there, he had a quarter of a million Greek troops, and he was now demanding from Paris permission for a major offensive. They hadn't said anything definite yet, but with Americans arriving by the hundreds of thousands in France, none of his troops were really going to be needed over there. So he keeps on asking. There might soon be action for the gardeners. I want to get back to diseases, though, and ones that were not region-specific. Now, there's this idea that many young men left for the war and died on the battlefields as virgins. This is largely a myth. If they were virgins when they left home, they most probably were not by the time they met their fate. If you didn't have the luck to meet a local the normal way, there were plenty of other options. On all of the fronts and on all sides, brothels were not only tolerated, they were systematically organized and in some cases even regulated by the armies to keep them as clean and as healthy as possible. There is the inevitable fact that young fighting men 
facing potential death, will do whatever they can to get some comfort and solace in the arms of another. But the customs of the different nations' armies made for different ways of dealing with that. The French, for example, had been issuing condoms to the troops to fight disease and prevent unwanted pregnancies as a standard part of equipment since the end of the 19th century. The Germans, the Russians, the Austrians, the Italians, all of those have been handing out condoms. Nations that do not do so for reasons of supposed morality are the nations of the Commonwealth and the United States. And this has pretty serious consequences. Here are some numbers that might surprise you. During the war, 416,891 soldiers of the British Empire's army were admitted to hospital for treatment of venereal disease. Yep, over 400,000. Compare that to just 74,711 cases of the more spoken of condition trench foot. Canadian soldiers who were better paid than well, their English counterparts, for example, and thus can afford more visits to brothels, and who also can't go home to their sweethearts on leave because they're overseas, they had it worse. In 1915, they have a venereal disease infection rate of 22%. Consider also the amount of cases of VD that were not treated. Some diseases like chlamydia or, or syphilis, they present little or no symptoms initially. There's also the embarrassment and shame that stops many from seeking treatment. And although many other armies are handing out condoms, that's not a foolproof solution either. First of all, you have to actually use the condoms. And even if you do, in the 19 teens, condoms are less than perfect. So the soldiers bring the diseases back home with predictable results, and you get epidemics of venereal disease among civilians all over the world. And it's not like civilians don't have enough to worry about as it is. Even in countries that were technically no longer part of the war, like Russia, there was still war going on all over, much of it fought by civilians, and all of it affecting daily life. On the 6th, the Allies declared Vladivostok, far to the east, a protectorate. Woodrow Wilson suggests the Japanese send 12,000 troops to aid the Czechoslovak Legion that's been making its way across Russia eastward, and Japan accepts. The Legion was fighting and beating the Bolsheviks all week in Siberia, occupied Irkutsk VIII, and under General Horvat, proclaimed a new Siberian government at Grodekovo, northwest of Vladivostok the 10th. They capture Kazan the 12th, and now control the Siberian railway east of Penza. Also, the Bolsheviks declared martial law in Moscow this week after the German ambassador there was assassinated. I gotta say a bit about that here. On July 6, two members of the left Socialist Revolutionary Party entered the embassy and killed Ambassador Count Wilhelm von Mirbach. He had taken part in the Brest-Litovsk negotiations earlier this year and became ambassador in April. Over the following days after the assassination, troops loyal to the left SRs seized the Moscow Post and the Telegraph, but the Bolsheviks soon re-established control. These events are the final split between these two once allies and were a big step toward the establishment of a one-party system in Russia. The left SRs and the Bolsheviks certainly described it differently on July 8th, the left SRs. The executioner of the laboring Russian people has been assassinated by the avenging hand of a revolutionary just on the day and the hour when the death sentence of the laboring masses was finally being signed and all the wealth of the laboring people were being surrendered to the German landowners and capitalists. The Bolsheviks. The insane rising of the so-called left SRs has been suppressed. They go on and on, and there's a link in the description to read the whole thing, but that first sentence pretty much sums up their whole attitude. Historians still question the purpose of his assassination, though. Was it part of an attempt to take power? Was it to coincide with the right SR uprising in Yaroslav, as historian E.H. Carr implies? though we talked a lot about the big split between the left and right SRs over the winter. Was it to provoke the Germans into canceling the Brest-Litovsk Treaty and attacking Russia and then removing the Soviets from power by war? Well, whatever it was, the Bolsheviks saw it as a betrayal and soon will have removed all SRs from any positions of power in Russia. And as the Bolsheviks reestablished control, and as the French and Italians launch a minor but successful series of attacks in southern Albania, the week comes to an end. A week of flu, 
malaria, and venereal disease in the summer sunshine. But you know, soldiers weren't just affected by naturally occurring diseases, they were creating diseases themselves. I read in Martin Gilbert's The First World War that on July 12th, the Allies premiered a new method of gas warfare. They used a train, and the train's cars were loaded with gas cylinders. This was brought up by light rail to the war zone, and then the cars manually pushed up close to the front. Then they detonated 5,000 gas cylinders at once a huge gray cloud formed and rolled across to the Germans, widening as it went. It worked well, causing hundreds of casualties. Someone in one of the gas companies, anonymously, wrote this about their work that day. Science of the ages, the highest arts of man, degraded and prostituted, that might should take the van, while empire, justice, freedom slumbered. Then chemist, student, artisan, answer duty's call, our arms, our arts, our poison fumes gain liberty for all. I'd like to thank Spartacus Olson for the research on venereal disease and the war. If you'd like to learn more about one of the Serbian generals that fought at the Salonika front, you can click right here for our special episode about Stepa Stepanovic. Our Patreon supporter of this week is Filip Radulovic. We could not do this show without you, so please, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.